Uh, so we're going to talk about wicked problems and also systems thinking, which is about how we can understand and help to solve wicked problems. So what's a wicked problem? Usually we think of this in terms of complexity. Something, uh, and when we think about complexity, a lot of times we're thinking uh, social complexity. A lot of times things can be confusing. There might not be clear solutions. There not, might not even be clear definitions of what the problem is. A lot of different kinds of people might have conflicting values um, about what the problem and solution might actually entail. So wicked problems are these tough problems. And I think also your problems that you are working on with your projects um, can be considered wicked problems as well because there's multiple solutions. Um, some of yours are more social than others, right? So if you're talking about, you know, the hilltop campus uh, path, right? There's maybe a lot of social issues in terms of what might uh, actually um, be involved with the overall system of the path, right? You're talking about safety and, uh, and things like that. Uh, here's some examples of what wicked problems might be, these big ones, right? How do you solve child mortality? How do you solve poverty? How do you, uh, you know, help the environment? How do we get the, have the best education? These are big issues. These are things that um, have multiple uh, issues, conflicts, things that uh, it's just very difficult uh, to actually solve. Uh, some examples of um, how wicked problems have been solved. Let me just give you, uh, talk about one here. Kickstart, not Kickstarter, but Kickstart is a nonprofit. They recognize that in Africa, 75% of children who are <coughs> born to uh, ra be raised on farms uh, have uh, big hunger issues. And so they, what they decided to do was build these cheap, um, irrigation pumps because they found out that if the farmers got uh, more water to create more crops, they would be able to then sell those crops uh, for more money so that they could uh, buy food and uh, live more sustainably. So that was kind of a simple solution, if you will, to help um, create uh, you know, better living conditions. So to try to uh, fix that particular problem. Uh, another maybe uh, wicked problem that you might think about is uh, what Blake McCoskey had dealt with with Tom's Shoes. Have you guys heard of Tom's Shoes before? Right, the idea of you, you buy Tom's Shoes and uh, they will give one free, one pair free to someone who really needs it. So he was in 2006 backpacking in Argentina and had seen that these uh, kids were not going to school and one of the reasons why they weren't going to school is because they didn't have shoes to wear to walk to school or to actually be allowed in school. He had to have shoes to be in school. So what he did is decided, well, I need to do something about this. So he created a business model where people would, you know, pay for, buy these shoes and then he would um, give one pair to uh, those kids. And so they ended up getting uh, these shoes to um, to wear. The question then is, did he solve the problem? That's maybe short term, but maybe not long term. So what, the, what he's been criticized for has been uh, that he basically put out of business any local cobbler who made shoes, right? And so that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Uh, they also did some research that showed that in fact those kids that were receiving these shoes also felt more dependence on others that they so it wasn't this idea of uh, teaching someone how to fish right instead of uh, it, it tended to be more of a charity thing instead of something that was sustainable um, uh, but a lot of companies have decided to go with this um, buy one give one model and uh, uh, Tom Shoes itself has actually uh, morphed over time, so they have evolved. 
and let me just show you what that looks like at this time. So they've decided to take on a whole other issue, ending gun violence. And so they have um, they basically say you, buying Tom's shoes is like a badge or something that it shows your social concern and and so they say okay so how, how are they doing this well they are they've created a goal end gun violence in the United States okay and so they are uh, they created a strategy to work with the community and so what's their approach they have three issue areas so they're looking at prevention so they're looking at creating culture of safety and um, reducing risk of gun violence using anonymous reporting and suicide prevention uh, some kind of intervention so uh, ceasefire strategies uh, to reduce homicides in given cities and then giving survivor support empowering survivors to become leaders in gun violence prevention. So they're looking at that in terms of uh, trying to reduce it in all these different places here. And so they use different partners um, that they have created. And so when you buy shoes, they then um, give money to these different organizations that are working toward those particular goals that they have set out. And so then you as a customer know what it is that your money is helping to go to. So that's what, um, that's what they're doing. Uh, they've realized that if you're going to address a social issue, it's more complex than just uh, taking one little thing and saying, oh, okay, shoes is going to solve it. No, there's more to it than that. Gun violence, there's all kinds of different issues um, involved in it. And so they're also going to address it in a more complex manner as well. All right, let's, uh, let's try this exercise here. This is to help us understand systems, okay? So what I would like you to do is uh, take out a sheet of paper, or I have some plain paper here, and what I want you to do is draw how to make toast. So without words, Okay, without words, draw how to make toast. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, raise them up. Let's see what let's see what they look like. Show us what do they look like? What do we have? Okay, we've got bread, so white bread, toaster, um, dark bread. You've got some arrows, and you got a, a big toaster. Okay, so you got a big toaster, so multiple pictures of toaster, that's good. You got a two toasts at the time, the bread, sliced bread beforehand. You got two toasts from bit both sides, right? And so then, okay, and then the things. Here we've got people involved. Oh, we've got, what's that? Market. Uh, county market. So you got to buy it first, right? So, and then you take it home, you uh, put it in the toaster. There's, you got a clock on there too. Shows the time. You've got butter, okay, and a knife. And here, um, that's nicely drawn. That's very nice and, and clear. Again, here oh, we've got motions. I, there's a behavior involved, right? You're looking at the toast. Or <laughs> you're eyeing that toast. Is that what it is? Eyeing the bread. You look for the toast, right? So you're probably saying, find the toast or find the bread, right? Because in fact, that's one of the things we end up doing, right? We scramble for the bread. <laughs> Where is it? Where is it, right? And then what do you have here? We've got nice big pictures. That's good. And then arrows around and on and off, okay, because how to use it, right, putting it down, you've got arrows for uh, where it goes, and then you're kind of showing that it's uh, like um, hot or something, and you've got to plug it in, right, so it's got to use energy, right, and here you're showing um, just more of a simple, look. here's the bread, there's the toast, right, good, okay, uh, what kinds of things do you think that you had in common with what, what we saw here, so again, sliced bread into the plugged-in thing. What, what what did we see? 
Yeah, we ha there is uh, lots of these what are called nodes, right? These kind of uh, visual steps, if you will. And then there was a lot of arrows and things like that. So things that were showing links. Some of you had s uh, step numbers. Otherwise, you had like arrows and stuff. So nodes and links helps us understand what a system is. And the system is how do you make toast? Let me just play a video here um, talking about this exercise and how they use this exercise in multi-million dollar companies to try to get um, uh, better design, better problem solving. about systems um, in just a little bit, some of the different 
aspects of it that you might be able to see, like feedback and stuff like that. Okay? But that's what I would suggest that you guys do at some point is visualize your system and use this type of technique. It's not something just for class, it's something that businesses are doing and they're doing it to save money and to uh, make their uh, company successful. All right, so <clears throat> to solve wicked problems, I think a lot of times when we're thinking about designing solutions, we come at it with this <coughs> idea of, uh, in fact, it's you know, very easy, I think, for you to start by thinking about what that uh, solution is. And we're still in the process of determining what the customer needs, right? What does the customer need? What really is the problem still? Uh, sometimes you do need to start thinking about different solutions because that gives you ideas for those needs too. Uh, but a lot of times we just decide, this is what we're supposed to do and let's just make it so, right? This is the design, let's make it so. But for some of these wicked problems, um, we need to think differently. And so we're going to talk about six or seven things for us to think about with our design projects and how we can think differently to maybe better uh, get at an aspect. So, uh, so a lot of times in, with some of your projects, you're just talking about an object, right? So the scuff prevention, I think you're designing an object <clears throat> but perhaps think about it as designing a behavior. So uh, here is a uh, urinal, okay? Uh, one of the problems that many uh, businesses face with the restrooms is cleanliness, right? Anybody who's gone into uh, places you see, you know, stuff all over, right? And so how do you solve that? Well, maybe design for the behavior. So this is actually a, um, a fly decal on a urinal. Why would somebody put a fly decal on a, on a urinal? Peyton? Get people to pee on it? Yep. <laughs> so aim, right? It's to change behavior. The idea is let's create a target to aim and that will help reduce any other splashing that might occur and sure enough it showed that it works. It's a, it's a weird thing, right? So you, instead of designing the object, you design uh, for the behavior and you come up with a solution that works. So think about that with your projects. Think about your project in terms of behaviors, behavioral systems. So instead of, okay, this is, you know, the scuff stuff, this is how much tension it can take and friction and whatnot. Think about, well, what's the behaviors, what are the behavioral interactions, those systems that will happen? Maybe, maybe the behaviors are how, how people actually drag things. Do they drag or do they pick it up and bang it down? Or, you know, what, what are some of those behavioral systems that you could, um, that you could uh, design for? Is it, uh, does your system need to show readiness? to be pulled, for instance, uh, you know, does it, um, what else about that could be behavior related? Here's another one, information flows. Think about the different information flows with your project. Just realize that um, research shows that um, when you are with other people, you tend to do the same types of behaviors because of the information flow. So for instance, if you join a fitness club, you tend to do fitness activities and you then tend to get fit. And so you will tend to lose weight by being with that group. So what are some um, uh, information flows that are important to your particular um, uh, project, right? If, you know, for the hilltop path, are there, um, are there certain clubs that will do walks or biking, you know, maybe there's a biking club that then would um, start to use that path in a different way, you know, what, what kinds of information flows might help you understand your system differently, okay? Faster iteration. Uh, so, uh, 
I think it's State Farm that has this um, cafe in Chicago called Next Door. See, it looks like a nice modern type building and the idea is you go in have coffee and donuts and stuff like that and they've created this to get uh, to kind of um, be able to talk to people and get to know well what might be their insurance needs so that they can create better insurance packages instead of just you know deciding behind closed doors oh this is what we think that they need or or bringing in you know focus groups or something they are having this happen out there constantly and they're constantly gathering information so that they can make faster iterations. Think about it in terms of a virus, for instance, right? A virus um, uh, replicates, you know, on a seconds basis, right? We as humans, you know, every 20 years we regenerate basically, right? So uh, the more iterations that you can create, the faster you can evolve, the faster you can make uh, changes and and be successful in your design. Then this is uh, something called embracing selective emergence. This is something called a strand beast. It's a, actually a piece of art made by a uh, Dutch artist, and these are uh, sculptures that he's created that uh, he sets on these beaches, and um, and they are self uh, they are self motivating. So they just go because of the wind. And how did he create this? What he did is he used something called genetic algorithms, which is a, a way of programming for the hip and leg joints. He didn't know what the best way of making the uh, hip and leg joints would be. And so he created this uh, genetic algorithm that basically worked it out for him. And this is the result. And so we can use technology to um, help us get at an end product when we don't know what the uh, what our uh, what our end product should actually be, so kind of interesting. You can find videos of this online too. It's kind of interesting, fun to watch actually. Um, and then focusing on purpose, um, knowing that what what your what your product or your service or your uh, or your system is supposed to do is going to uh, be important for understanding what you should be including in this. And so the, the purpose is important. And Steve Jobs, of course, is uh, famous for uh, making that happen with uh, all of the Apple products. And then realizing that design is never done, that, um, uh, that there's always room for improvement, that it's, we can't always have the ultimate thing that there is. I know that you have a, a deadline, uh, so you'll just need to leave it where it should be, but realize, hey, there's, there's always something more that, that you could uh, end up doing. All right, so some takeaways from what we've just talked about is uh, realizing that um, you know, using like this links and nodes process where you bring together the different iterations and combine your different perspectives as a team are very important for coming up with better solutions to solving these uh, wicked problems. And uh, we are better off together uh, if we can use these uh, different tools. And then also realizing that um, we can't just solve wicked problems with just traditional methods. We need to think of uh, think things uh, in a different way. So, which leads us to uh, us talking a little bit more about systems thinking, okay, and understanding what is it that we mean by systems. You guys basically created a system with your uh, with your toast exercise. Uh, so, what I'd like you to do is uh, maybe on the uh, well, on a sheet of paper, what I want you to do is answer these questions, okay? So answer if it's true, somewhat true, or false, okay? So how do you actually approach a difficult problem at school or at work? So think about maybe an actual, you know, maybe it's this project. How do you, how are you approaching it?
Okay, you guys set? So this is how you uh, should score it, okay? So sum up questions one to six and eight and nine to give true three points, sum up true two points, and one point false. Okay, for question seven, the points are reversed, so do the opposite and add that total together, okay? And so you should end up with a number. <clears throat> if your number is 21 or higher, you might be considered a systems or a systemic type thinker. If, you're, if you have less than 15, you probably focus on individual parts of a problem, maybe more an analytic thinker. Okay. How many of you fall in that analytic thinking part? Or maybe you haven't added up yet. So there's value in both kinds of thinking here. Of course, what we're talking about is systems thinking. So whether or not where you land, it's a matter of, well, it would be good to maybe be able to do both, both system thinking and analytic thinking. Here's an example of how um, a systems thinker versus a non-systems thinker would think. So, you're feeling tired every day. You wonder, okay, how can I stop feeling so tired every day? You, uh, a non-systems thinker might say, you know what, I probably need to up my caffeine level, so I'm going to have some more coffee, right? And that makes sense at a certain level, right? Up my caffeine level, maybe then that will prevent me from being tired. But a systems thinker would then think about, well, what are all the factors that are involved in me feeling tired? And I might diagram or think about the connections between all the things. So for instance, you might think, okay, drinking coffee affects my energy, but it also affects my sleep. And so then you might then come to identify or come to conclude, oh, wait a second, my coffee actually interferes with my sleep, and that is what makes me tired. So maybe I should reduce my coffee. So do you see? Here, a non-systems thinker says, more coffee. A systems thinker says, they're looking more at the whole and realizing, wait a second, less coffee is what I need, and that will make me um, less tired. So it's understanding what are all of the relationships involved. So when you are thinking about uh, your project and thinking about the systems, the more you can identify all the different factors the more likely you're going to find all these different um, factors that cause different behaviors or cause different um, solutions to occur, right? So when we think of a system, just so that we understand, right? A system is basically a set of interrelated um, parts, okay? It could be that we have, you know, these different systems, the skeletal system, the respiratory system within our bodies, right? And our whole body is a system itself, so there's subsystems here. Uh, teams are systems because there's interrelated parts. Cities are uh, systems. The world is a system, right? It's an ecosystem, right? A company is a system. There are interrelated parts, people doing things together, and, and hopefully they are creating some kind of synergy where the whole is greater than the parts. Right? So um, <clears throat> what we try to do is better understand systems theory and use some, um, some systems techniques to try to help us solve these wicked problems. So for instance, one uh, wicked problem has been uh, trying to reduce traffic congestion. Well, what, so my question here is why does building bigger roads make traffic worse? So, it, so most cities will decide, oh, let's expand, let's add a lane, 
and that's going to reduce traffic congestion. And so, for instance, in Houston, they spent several billion dollars on this big project where at one point you have 26 lanes, 26 lanes across. And it increased morning traffic commute by 30%, and it increased uh, uh, or delays, uh, increased the delay by 30%, and it increased the, the evening delay by 55%. So it's not, um, so of course there's more cars going, but the delay was longer. Why is that happening? It's happening because something called induced demand. So it's when you make it, you know, when you build it, they'll come, right? That's the, the field of dreams idea, right? An Iowa analogy, right? Um, it, it, people then decide, oh, I'm going to take the highway because that's where, you know, it's easy uh, to do, right? So, so some company or some cities have decided on a couple other kinds of solutions, which is either tollways to then create a cost to do that, so then people aren't as willing to, to get on that. But of course, that creates other problems, which is things like inequity, right? It's almost like a, a regressive tax on people who have to commute to their, right? They, they're living further out because they don't make as much money and it's harder to, um, or it's uh, cheaper housing, so they have to drive in and so then you're taxing those people who have those longer commutes. It's not um, good equity-wise, right? So another uh, solution has been actually to eliminate highways. To instead of have the highways, you have other forms of transportation or other forms of roads instead of these big highways that uh, that create these kinds of uh, issues. So, uh, kind of interesting to think about. Here's another way of thinking about systems in terms of feedback loops. Okay, so uh, so one problem we have is um, with uh, something as simple as advertising. Let's increase our advertising budget. That's going to make us more profitable, right? Well, yes and maybe no. If we increase our advertising budget, we're probably going to increase our sales, right? Increase our sales, increase our profits, but maybe not because actually that makes us start to have to stock up on our inventory. We end up having to build another warehouse that creates a delay. We're hiring more people that adds to the costs and which reduces our profits. So we have, we've got this up cycle going and then this um, down cycle going on this side so that in fact maybe by increasing our advertising costs we actually uh, might decrease our profits at least maybe short term, hopefully longer term it's going to be okay depending on how long those delays are and how much that ends up costing, right? So this is a good uh, thing to be understanding is how, how do systems uh, work together and what are those feedback loops. So here's a few tools that you guys can use in your project and let me and I'll just um, talk about each of these. I guess we won't have time necessarily to do these, but maybe uh, maybe we'll be able to do. Um, why don't we do this? So turn your uh, turn your paper over, and I want you to sketch out your stress level for the week. Okay, so here's an example of sketch level. So stress level. So what, ha what was your um, stress level? Well, I guess this is stress level over the past day or three days or a week, whatever makes sense to you. So put a timeline down, right? Time and level of stress. So when did that occur? So you could either think of a day, you know, morning, noon, night, or you could think of you know, Monday through Sunday, that type of thing, okay? This is actually a good wellness exercise to do because you can then think about maybe how to better plan, how to better design what it is that you are doing. <laughs> I 
Might somebody want to share with us what, what they have? What do you see? What, what's an example? Did you do week? Yeah, I did. What, uh, show, show, uh, show us what it looks like. Okay. Okay, so yours is kind of up and down, so there's some modulating stuff. Hopefully it's not just a slow increase to disaster, <laughs> right? <laughs> but yeah, okay, so that's modulate. Which is, which is your higher stress days? Uh, Monday, Tuesday. Monday, yeah. Tuesday. Like, tests. Any tests? Okay. How about for you? Also tests? Okay. How about for you? What would yours look like? Tuesday, Thursday. Is that because you got more classes or? And baseball. Okay. So yeah, so there's a, another mitigating factor, right? What else? What what do, what does yours look like? What did you do? Tuesday. Kind of Tuesday. Okay. So there's so you can identify certain times and maybe think about well, what is it that is actually going on at those times? If you were thinking about the the time of the day, you know maybe it's you know if your stress level is really high in the morning, maybe it's because you are not taking enough time to get ready, right? Rushing out the door, trying to get to class, right? That could be. Or if your stress level is high at night, it's, oh, I didn't get to my stuff during the day, and so I tend to be more stressed at night. So you can uh, help, uh, you know, help make different plans. So what I suggest that you guys, well, so how could you use this for your project? How could you use this behavior over time graph? Peyton? Okay. <laughs> okay. So actually, uh, use it as a way to um, to manage your time for the actual project. To say, okay, I'm not as stressed. These. This is when I should schedule the time for that. But how would you use it to help solve your problem with your project? What could you do to help solve your problem with your project? So is there, you know, for instance, for the scuff floor thing, is there over time, what would that graph, and maybe it's uh, wearing, right? It would probably go up over time. So how fast would that go up? It would go like this, or what does it go like? So that might help you determine what materials you might use. So you, might, you could com compare different materials. Some might go like this, some might go like this, and then finally go up, right? So there might be a failure at the end. So there could be, so that could be a way to decide on materials. So with each of your projects, there's probably some way that you could use this behavior over time graph to understand the system in place. Uh, here's a collecting cluster. So okay, so what I want you to do is um, related to your stress again on that same piece of paper, write factors that are related to your stress and then group them by category. Actually, what you could do is I have uh, some slips here if you want to. Write down what are some of those factors that are related, and stick it on your on your paper. So just start just start writing factors related to your stress. You know, one one idea per per sticky note. See if you can get eight factors. Are you seeing some clusters? Yeah. Good. And so what's that going to help you do by clustering that? Making the clusters, how, how would this be helpful? To help explore your problem of trying to reduce stress, right? The problem would, would be, let's try to reduce your stress. You could maybe take, what, the highest cluster and start there. So it might help you prioritize what's most important. So with your project, if you're starting to, what are the biggest factors related to uh, solving your problem, start with the, the one that you had the biggest cluster for. You know, for the, um, uh, the scuff floor thing. Is, is it wear and tear that's the biggest issue? Or is it just, um, I don't know, other um, 
weight issues or something like that. Maybe there's those kinds of things that are most important. And that'll help you determine, well, what should you spend your time on? Okay, then feedback loops. Take, take your uh, list and um, see if you can match up to to create a feedback loop. Is there one item that affects another item? So for instance, tiredness felt affects amount of sleep, right? The more tiredness you feel affects the amount of sleep that you have. The amount of sleep that you have affects the uh, tiredness that you feel, right? So, and then is it, is it a positive relationship or is it a negative relationship? Is it positive on one side, negative on the other, or is it all positive or is it all negative, right? I'm... I feel tired, so I eat donuts. The donuts, the, and that I, more donuts I eat, the more tired I feel, right? So that would be a, a positive feedback loop with negative consequences, right? <laughs> Do you see, uh, does anybody have a, uh, a sample that they could show us? What do you have? School and internship. School and internship. So, what, uh, so time at school and time at inter Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the internship, maybe, well, what will that do with school then? Uh, I guess it'll help you uh, graduate and, and uh, check off your requirements, right? Good. Okay. So this is uh, the other thing that you can do with your project as you've mapped out different uh, factors you decide, well, what kinds of feedback loops are there? Are there certain ones that are more important than others? Then you can put it into a causal map where you are actually um, looking at all the different relationships of all the different things. And so in the end here, what it does is it helps you look at the big picture instead of just focusing on you know, the objects, right? You're looking at the behaviors, so you're looking at the interactions, you're looking at the overall systems so that you can identify different trends and identify the underlying structure. You can see cause and effect going on. You can see what kinds of assumptions that you're making, right? And maybe you need to question what those assumptions are. Uh, maybe you can understand better what those unintended consequences are so you're not just, you know, creating this Tom Shoes idea of buy one, give one. You're now deciding, oh, this is, I need to uh, help solve this problem because it's more complex than what I originally thought. So finding what are the biggest leverage points for making change in your system would be important. And then try not to make these uh, quick conclusions. So. Just in summary here, these are all the tools that you should be using to help you in solving your wicked problems, okay? Right, this idea of the links and nodes, where you're listing all those things, doing iterations by seeing, well, how, uh, how do these all fit together, using each other to collaborate so that you see from different perspectives, and then uh, using this behavior over time graph collecting and clustering to create different categories for prioritization, uh, understanding how some of these factors influence each other in feedback loops, and then putting it all together in some kind of causal maps. And again, you could use that drawtoast.com for several different templates if you want to, or just use simple sticky notes or recipe cards. That's uh, kind of the, the best advice I would, I would give. But it, the idea is using visualization, getting it out there. It's a way to help work together and get all of your ideas um, in front of you so that you can help actually solve the problem. It's not just something that you do in kindergarten class. It's something that they do in these uh, big businesses to save lots of money as well. Okay, anybody have any uh, questions about this or about the uh, report one?